Yes. Go ahead. So, as long back as more than 2,500 uh, 500 years ago, Hippocrates has quoted that death sits in the bowels and the bad digestion is the root of all evil. So I just designed my presentation, uh, a few definitions, factors affecting the gut microbiota, colonization of the gut by the bacteria in the neonates, <clears throat> and how microbe flora actually shape up the immune system, and what are the various mechanisms which if they go wrong, they can cause autoimmunity and potential translational role. So microbiota is a set of microorganisms that live in an established micro environment. And today we are much more focusing on gut. So we'll be just talking about the gut microflora. And this is the largest flora actually in the whole body. Other sites are there, which I will be enumerating in the subsequent slide. And these microbiota actually plays a fundamental role in the induction, training and function of the host immune system. <clears throat> so these are the various sites where microbiota or microbiome uh, sort of resides in the human body. And the largest one is the intestine. Both the host as well as the microflora in the gut or the other sites, they live in a symbiotic relationship. And today happens to be the friendship day. So we can say that the microflora is one of the greatest friends of the host and especially mammals and humans as such. So let's look at the gut microbiota a bit in detail. As we move from the stomach to the colon, the frequency or the number of bacteria which resides in the uh, gut, they kept on increasing with a variability in their uh, sort of species. And also, if we try to look at the gut microbiota near the epithelial surfaces or within the lumen of the intestine, we can find that different species prefer different localization. The gut microbiome actually starts establishing as early as 10 weeks post conception within the in utero, the gut flora actually starts developing. And subsequent to delivery, it depends on the maternal diet, maternal lifestyle, any exposure of mother to the antibiotics, what is the birth mode of the child, whether it is a normal delivery, vaginal delivery, or whether it is a cesarean section? And what is the feed mechanism of the child, whether breastfeeding or top feed, or if there is any exposure to any drug, especially antibiotics, which can alter the microflora, it changes the gut uh, microbiome. <clears throat> uh, in the gut microflora, actually, firmicutes and the bacteroidetes are the most common microflora or the bacteria which resides in the gut. However, other uh, species also from actinobacteria or proteobacteria are also there, but they are much less in abundance as compared to firmicutes and the bacteroidetes. What are the functions uh, these microbiota play? So they have got a lot of uh, physiological functions that they help with the metabolism of the dietary components, especially the fiber of the diet that is metabolized by the various enzymes secreted by the gut microflora. They modulate the immune system. Also, they have an effect on the intestinal motility and they also help in cholesterol metabolism and various vitamin synthesis. We know that besides these functions within the lumen, they also have got physiological functions which affect the other distant organs. Like there are certain gut bacteria which produce uh, certain neuroactive compounds which actually helps in the development of the brain. They also regulate uh, their satiety, digestion, and resist the colonization by the pathogenic bacteria and provides nutrient to the gut epithelium. Besides, we are interested in our immune uh, system. <clears throat> so they regulate immune system development and its priming, which I will be discussing in subsequent slides. So as we look into the gut microbiota, we can say that the gut microbiota actually is uh, being recognized by the epithelial cells and the immune cells which are present in the gut 
because of their association with the molecular patterns which are present on the bacteria. There is uh, various mucosal microbiota which regulates immune functions and they help in shaping up the regulatory or the pro-inflammatory environment within the intestine as well as the systemic inflammatory immune responses. So just to briefly recapitulate what is happening in the neonate gut and how it adapts to the microbial colonization. Because of the relative immaturity of the neonate immune system, as the child is getting delivered, the gut is acquiring a lot of bacteria into it. But since the immune system is immature, it doesn't mount any particular set of immune response to this. In addition, colostrum and the breast milk contains various live microbes, as well as other metabolites, immunoglobulin A and various immune cells along with cytokines, which also regulate the colonization by the microbes and doesn't allow the microbes which are colonizing the gut to mount an inflammatory immune response and cause sepsis in the, uh, in the neonate. Maternal immunoglobulin A restricts the immune activation and also doesn't allow the microbial attachment to the epithelial cells by binding to various microbial antigens. And various metabolites in the mother's milk, it actually promotes, like oligosaccharides, they promote the expansion of certain <clears throat> good commensals which are beneficial to the host, like bifidobacterium. Also, there is an innate <clears throat> cell which is localized in the gut which is called as an invariant natural killer T cell. It has a property of mounting an intense inflammatory response. But as soon as commensals are getting colonized in the gut, the number of invariant natural killer cells goes down through the inhibitory sphingolipids which are released by <clears throat> these bacteria. So the gut is basically, and also the immune, innate immune cells which are present in the gut, they are uh, not allowed to mount oxygen-free radical-like reactions. Rather, they are uh, sort of um, uh, diverted toward a, a direction of secretion and production of a lot of IL-10. Now, IL-10 is basically a regulatory cytokine, which has property of suppressing all kind of inflammatory immune responses. But since the gut is very leaky in the neonate, so how does this colonization of the bacteria by microflora actually is uh, maintained in the gut without harming the host? So the host maintains its homeostatic relationship with the microbiota by certain factors, which are mucus, which doesn't allow of these commensals to come in contact with the gut epithelial cells release of various antimicrobial peptides and immunoglobulin A also, which doesn't allow the pathogenic bacteria to bind to the gut epithelial cells and cause damage to it. Also, there is a population of resident macrophages which are present in the lamina propria, deep into the layer of the gut, which has got a unique property that it uh, whatever commensals, if they translocate uh, into the lamina propria, they can be taken up by these resident macrophages and can be cleared from there. Also, there is a unique population of dendritic cells which are present in the lamina propria. These unique uh, dendritic cells have a configuration of a CD marker of 103 positive, 11B positive dendritic cells and they have got a role in induction of T regulatory cells. Now T regulatory cells are very important because this is a sort of a master regulator of the inflammatory immune responses. Also, some of the peptides secreted or metabolites secreted by the gut commensals, they actually cause upregulation and induction of TH17 cells. Now these cells are important because they have got an inflammatory property. Yeah. But here in the gut, when this 
development is happening because of the common cells. These TA17 cells are not mounting an inflammatory immune response, rather they are helping the other cells, especially the B cells and the plasma cells, so that there's a lot of secretory immunoglobulins A, which again help in protecting the gut. So how does the gut microbiota shape up the immune system? It has been observed, especially in the animal studies, that germ-free mice, if you look at their gut, they have got a very small peer patches, and they've got a reduced number of CD4 positive T cells, and also a very slight uh, population of IgA producing plasma cells. Not only the gut, my, my immune cells are actually getting less if they are raised in the germ-free environment. The commensals also promote the epithelial cell maturation and angiogenesis. Now, this epithelial cell maturation is important because it does not allow the gut to remain leaky and doesn't allow the bacteria translocate into the deeper layers of the gut, which can cause an inflammation. Just to introduce uh, what are the immune cells? We know that there are two types of immune system which are active in the body. One is innate and the other one is adaptive. Innate has got all kind of granulocytes and monocyte and macrophages. Dendritic cells are special cells which sit on the fence between the innate and the adaptive immune system. Whereas we know that adaptive immune system is most important and that too which constitute T and B cells. And among these two, the T cells are most important because if there is a T cell deficiency, then the survival is very unlikely unless you do a bone marrow transplantation. So various uh, subtypes of T cells like Th1, Th2, Th17, Trex, there are many more Th9 or Th22 or T follicular helper cells. Now I will have a brief word about T follicular helper cells because these T cells, once they are activated, they go into the germinal center. And here they actually help the B cells to acquire long-term memory phenotype as well as to convert into a long-term secretory plasma cell. Uh, just uh, not in context of the gut microbiota, but uh, as we are all facing the pandemic of COVID, COVID has this unique property of down-regulating this T follicular helper cell population, whereby a very poor B cell responses are mounted and that is why probably the immunoglobulin levels, they fade away in COVID patients after three to six months. So let's see how actually the gut microbiota actually shape up the immune cells. The, it has been observed in animal studies that the animals which are raised in the germ-free environment, they have got uh, very little of FOXP3. FOXP3 is a marker of T regulatory cells, T regulatory cells. But if these uh, mice are uh, sort of grown in an environment where they have got a lot of clostridia, then the T regulatory cell population is markedly increased. So it clearly establishes the fact that the uh, clostridial species through some mechanism, through some metabolite secretion, are actually causing upregulation of T regulatory cells. And in subsequent studies, it was also realized that this uh, upregulation of T-Rex is happening because of synthesis or secretion of butyrate, which are produced by these clostridia. Then there are uh, other uh, experiments where people have looked at the development of Th1 immune responses. In the germ-free environment, the frequency of Th1 cells is much less, 11%, as compared to conventional cultures or conventionally grown mice where it is around 17%. And it was realized that in the presence of, uh, when these germ-free mice were actually uh, uh, grown in an environment of bacillus fragilis, the uh, CD4 T cell population increased to almost conventional, uh, conventionally grown mice. But when we actually causes, they grow the mice in a 
setting of a bacillus fragilis, which is not having a polysaccharide A antigen. Then again, the uh, population of Th1 cells remains low. So clearly establishing a fact that uh, that polysaccharide A antigen of bacillus fragilis <coughs> is actually allowing the Th1 cell development in the gut. There is no effect on the CD19 that is a B cell and a CD8 that is a cytotoxic B cell development by this polysaccharide A and B. So clearly it can be seen that when the mice are grown uh, uh, in the uh, sort of in presence of bacillus fragilis, then they are likely to have more of a TH1 kind of a immune responses. Not only polysaccharide A antigen uh, causes upregulation of TH1, but it also causes upregulation of T regulatory cells in a different animal model. And here the animal model is basically trinitrobenzene uh, induced uh, colitis model, uh, which was ameliorated by introduction of polysaccharide A antigen. And the polysaccharide A antigen actually causes upregulation of T cells, which are secreting a lot of IL-10. That is the property of T regulatory cells. So clearly showing that the metabolites of the or the components of the bacteria in the gut actually shapes up our immune system. Also, <clears throat> this study where the mice were grown in a germ-free environment, they hardly have any kind of TH17 cells, 0 0.06. But when these germ-free mice were brought to an environment where they were uh, grown in presence of segmental filamentous bacilli, then the frequency of TH17 cells in, increased up to 14%. And again, this is a specific pathogen-free environment where only few pathogens are introduced. The frequency was increased as compared to the germ-free, but was much less as compared to the segmented filamentous bacilli. So clearly showing that that segmental filamentous bacilli induces TS17 cell differentiation in mice, which were earlier uh, grown in germ-free environment. So <clears throat> we can say that there are there are a lot of other studies which I have not included for the sake of the time. That uh, the intestinal immunity is regulated by butyrate producing Clostridia, which modulate Tdex by polysaccharide A, which produces TH1 immune responses and also T regulatory cells, and the segmental filamentous bacteria, which actually causes upregulation of TH17 cells. So that is for how it is shaping up. But what is the beneficial effect of these microbiota? The microbiota in the gut actually doesn't allow the harmful or the pathogenic bacteria to grow. Because of competition for the nutrients, because of synthesis of the antimicrobial peptides, because of the microbiota, and various other metabolites of these uh, gut microbiota, which directly hampers the growth of pathogenic bacteria. So here, what we can say that they have an effect on the macrophages, dendritic cells, and also on the TH17 and TH1 cells, and the B cells to secrete a lot of uh, immunoglobulin A, and the various anti uh, antimicrobial peptides, which doesn't allow the pathogens which are harmful to grow. In a normal healthy environment, the balance between the uh, TH17 and T regulatory is maintained because of the gut microbiota. However, wherever this setting is disturbed, either there is increase in the pro-inflammatory bacteria, like here the segmental filamentous bacteria are much more as compared to the bacillus fragilis, then the balance will shift in favor of TS17. Or if there is any reduction in the anti-inflammatory bacteria, the bacillus fragilis goes down, then also the balance shifts in favor of TS17. So clearly causing a gut dysbiosis. We'll see subsequently how it is going to affect. Uh, few antimicrobial proteins are very important. One is this what is called as REC3 gamma. This is a very potent antimicrobial uh, protein secreted by the gut epithelial cells. And these are secreted because various metabolites of the commensals 
when they interact with the innate lymphoid cells of type 3 which are present in the lamina propria of the neonate or in gut of uh, adults also they allow these innate lymphoid cells to uh, secrete a lot of il22 and this il22 actually stimulates the epithelial cells to secrete this rec3 gamma and rec3 gamma doesn't allow the uh, sort of proliferation and survival of various pathogenic bacteria like <coughs> listeria or yersinia pseudotuberculosis in this particular paper besides the pathogenic bacterial influence the gut microflora has also an important role in development of neutrophils the gut microflora especially the gamma proteobacteria they have got a lot of lipopolysaccharides which interact with its ligand tlr4 on the gut epithelial cells and also uh, through the secretion of a lot of metabolites causes activation of innate lymphoid cells these innate lymphoid cells, besides IL-22, they are also very rich source of secretion of IL-17. And this IL-17 causes upregulation of GCSF. And as we know that granulocyte colony stimulating factor is important for proliferation and the growth of uh, neutrophils in the bone marrow. That is how it actually helps in the regulation of the neutrophil number and also helps in protection from the sepsis. Another important cell which is there in the gut is the invariant NKT cell. This is normally present in the germ-free environment. The number of NKT cells is very high, but as soon as the commensals are there in the gut, the number goes down. And this is important because otherwise uh, in the germ-free environment, if you allow some kind of a dysbiosis to happen, then there will be a lot of inflammation which is going to happen. and uh, but because of the common cells, this population of invariant NKT cells is less. So the uh, inflammation is much less when the common cells are actually colonizing the gut. I'll not go into the detail of this animal model where they have used oxazolone induced colitis model. But the nutshell uh, conclusion of this study was that when the neonates are exposed to microbes, it limits the expansion of invariant NKT cells, which make them less susceptible to colitis. So we have seen that the regulation of the systemic immunity is happening because of the antimicrobial peptide, especially RAC3 gamma. It helps in the development of neutrophils also and doesn't allow expansion of invariant NKT cells. So this is a sum total of the uh, uh, sort of experiment that the gut microbiota have an effect on epithelial cells, which secrete a lot of mucus and also a lot of uh, antimicrobial peptides and in the lamina propria it regulates t regulatory cells ts 17 cells and innate lymphoid cells also which actually uh, uh, protects the and provides a homeostatic environment so that gut remains uh, sort of protective and doesn't allow any pathogenic bacteria to leak into it i'll briefly show very uh, simple experiments that what is the role of gut microbiota in a setting of ibd in the setting of IBD, basically what is happening is that the individuals are genetically susceptible and because of various environmental stress like diet stress or infection, there is leakage of the pathogenic bacteria which allows the homeostasis to be disturbed and there is a lot of TH17 cells. Now these are pathogenic TH17 cells and pathogenic TH1 cells, whereas the regulatory environment of the gut in form of T regulatory cells, IL-10 or the REC3 gamma, it goes down. And that is why the inflammation of the gut at least starts. A lot of diseases has been implicated with the gut, like even multiple sclerosis. And a very recent study where Pribitola cyticola has been shown to have an influence on the induction of the TS17 cells, which are in, uh, induced and they go into the brain to cause multiple sclerosis. And the various other diseases, which Dr. Professor Anita has also enumerated in her introductory uh, part, are also have been implicated to be associated with the dysbiosis in the gut. I will briefly show that there is some data to show the various uh, species of the bacteria commensals altered in a setting of rheumatoid arthritis. So is in lupus where the bacteroids and the firmicutes ratio is actually changed 
and which actually predisposes towards SLE. And same is true for the IBD. What is the translational role of understanding of all this? That probably we can somehow modulate our diet, uh, then probably we can actually have some control of the immune system and can decrease the disease. <clears throat> People have tried out with the probiotics in spondyloarthropathy. They have shown, but not great influence. This was a paper way back in 2007. And very recently, fecal microbiota transplant is coming up in a big way, especially in IBD. And this study has shown that around 28% of the subjects who has undergone a fecal microbiota transplantation had a clinical remission as compared to placebo. <clears throat> uh, but there was actually concern in this study because a lot of patients develop <coughs> uh, drug resistant E. coli bacteremia yeah, also, also with the FMT. FMT. So, so coming, coming to my last slide, slides, the, the take-home take message, message from, from the presentation, presentation is that that, that microbiota is diverse, influenced by various factors, and it can, can be changed by diet, diet and the drugs. drugs. It influences it our immune system, our system in multiple, multiple ways, ways, which I have enumerated. Various microbial profiles have been associated, associated with various, various diseases, diseases and, and it is still an ongoing, ongoing process, process where we are learning every day. And, and probably we can modulate these, these uh, uh, factors and can have some kind of a control in the disease. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge my senior resident, Dr. Pankti, and my young scientist, Mohit, and Dr. Durga, who actually helped me in. Uh, preparing this presentation today. Thank you. Thank you.